uh, Switzerland and so on. Uh, so our picture we had uh, three years ago was that the birds migrate west and south uh, to the wintering grounds, uh, stay there more or less at the same place or not, we didn't know, and then return more inland back to the breeding grounds. What we did not know was uh, which breeding population goes to which uh, wintering site. So the question of connectivity. Uh, but we had some hints. Um, um, published some ring recoveries published in 2012. So there was one bird ringed in the inner Niger Delta in Mali, which was recovered four months later by us during our former geolocator study in Supi Valley. So this was two, two sites that are connected. And we had a, an aquatic warbler female, which was ringed in wintering site in Juche in Senegal and recovered in the middle basin of Biebscher marshes. What we also know uh, through the ringing work of our Dutch and Belgish and French and Spanish Portuguese colleagues is that in the northern uh, stopover sites in the Low Countries and northern France, the proportion of juvenile birds is very, very high, uh, more than 90%, and that the proportion of adult birds increases towards the south, and that in northwest Spain and in Portugal we have uh, approximately 50% adult birds in, uh, on the, at the stopover sites. In Cota Doniana, even 87% adult birds. So we can conclude that uh, juvenile birds obviously go to the west first until they meet the coast and then to the south. And adult birds go more directly uh, to the southwest. And one assumption was that uh, female birds, which stay longer in the breeding sites, could go maybe more southwest direction than male birds, which are not in a hurry. But this was only a guess. OK, that was what we knew. So then we had some information about the wintering grounds. Uh, they are here in one slide, the hatched areas. These are uh, possible wintering sites uh, mm, from analysis from stable isotopes in aquatic warbler feathers in the breeding site. So it was same picture, something between Senegal Delta and Inner Niger Delta. Uh, the, the dark spots, fly droppings, uh, with arrows that are sites from the satellite image analysis with uh, probably suitable habitat. And the circles uh, are wintering records. So records in January or February, uh, ringing records or other records. So in nine, uh, 2007, we found the first big wintering site in Huge in Senegal Delta with an international expedition. Uh, and captured uh, nearly 60 aquatic warblers there, and in the following years, uh, 150 more. Um, and in 2011, the French group Acrola, uh, Julien Fouché and friends, uh, investigated some sites in southern Mauritania and in Mali, and they found one aquatic warbler in January in uh, one site in Southwest Mauritania and three others in another site at another site. And they even managed to went to the inner Niger Delta despite of the critical situation, safety situation, and uh, captured 13 birds in the inner Niger Delta. One of those we recaptured in Supi in Ukraine. So these are the confirmed um, wintering sites since 2007. So, and uh, 
here on this map I indicated uh, sites which are dependent on flooding, that are the green marked sites that are uh, known rendering sites or potential sites, potential habitats, and uh, yellow or brown uh, sites are sites which depend on local precipitation, mainly in the southern Sahara Desert. So and, uh, then we had another geolocator study in 2012-2013 uh, with birds from Supi in central Ukraine and Dikoye in southwestern Belarus. And uh, we had some problems with the geolocators. Some birds lost their geolocators. Others had malfunctions or were only logging the data until October or November. And we had only seven birds, uh, data from seven birds from wintering sites. And these localizations are rather unprecise. You can see it in this huge uh, standard error lines, the yellow lines. But all these uh, seven birds spent, that spent the winter in Mali. It was clear. So we know, we knew three years ago that birds from Supi go to Mali and birds from Dikoye go to Mali. But what's with birds from, ah, and we know that at least some birds from Biebcha go to Senegal and spend the winter in Djuj. Um, but what's about birds from Lithuania? Do they also go to Senegal? Can assume maybe, because uh, further northwest. And what is with birds from Juventus uh, and Servetsch, maybe? And uh, this question was especially interesting uh, in connection with the translocation uh, operation, which we heard about in Jumanta's talk. So we decided to uh, go to Servetsch and uh, Lithuania and fit uh, geolocators to aquatic warblers. And we decided to change the provider uh, and uh, from a Swiss provider to uh, go to UK to migrate technologies and to try an, another type of geolocator. So here you can see the, the breeding populations of aquatic warbler and the study sites, Servetsch, and in Lithuania, Chirai and Eikapolda. So a short introduction into the study sites. This is a wonderful area of Servetsch. We have already seen pictures from the Belarusian colleagues. There are two such fan myers, a big one and a small one. This is a big one in the foreground around the lake. It's an isolated site in northern Belarus with a reasonable population size of between 30 and 60 aquatic warblers. So the probability of recover the birds in the next year is high. And this is the large Savage Meyer. But this is a small one. When we arrived in 2018, in late June, habitat of the large Savage Meyer. So very nice habitat. Um, this is Tirai Marsh at the Korunian Lagoon. You can see the sand dunes on the Korunian Spit in the background. So this is uh, dependent on, um, on wind tide of the Baltic Sea. Uh, more or less. And this is the northern part of Tirai. And this is the third study site in Eikapolda in uh, 30 kilometers southwest of Tirai marshes, more inland in Lithuania. Uh, mostly used mode um, sedge meadows, wet sedge meadows. So most of you know how to catch aquatic warblers. You look for single males and establish mist nets and try to attract the males with tape lure and 
friendly pushing towards the net can help. Um, so it was rather easy to get this uh, these uh, birds, uh, 29 in Servetsch and 31 in Belarus. The only uh, problem was that the song activity was dropping dramatically in the end of June. So that we stopped after 29 birds in Belarus and saved 31 uh, for Lithuania because the activity was, was too low. So the birds were measured, weighted and fitted with geolocators. These are these geolocators from Migrate Technology. They are even smaller and lighter than uh, the Swiss devices. Uh, weight is only 0.36 gram, less than 0.4 gram. And um, there's a Benedict Giesing on the right hand. He was the chief of the harness technology. So the loops, uh, which we need to fix the, the geolocators on the bird and Benjamin Herold on the left side. And we spent quite a lot of time to prepare the geolocators and to adjust the, the loops of the harnesses. We had the impression that the harness loops have been a little bit too big. And so we made some of them smaller, the biggest of them it was a work in the first day. And we measured all harnesses, the, the span of the harnesses, and sorted them into size categories. So we had three different size categories and we uh, then fit a, could take the best fitting geolocator for, for the respective bird. Uh, bigger birds uh, got larger harnesses and smaller birds, smaller harnesses. We don't know how important this was, but at the end, uh, we had no case that uh, birds lost their geolocator and all birds were in a very good condition after recapture. So I think it was a very good, good idea to spend such uh, high attention to the harnesses. So this is a bit of Russian aquatic warbler with geolocator. You can see the stick at the back, which collects sunlight and leads it to, to the sensor. Yeah, after one year, we had to find the, geo, uh, the birds again and to recapture them to take the geolocators. That means we had to uh, watch the birds in the mice, uh, observe them, look at the, the, whether they have rings or not, and all birds which had rings were captured. And yeah, quite um, the, the high, pro high proportion of the ringed birds had geolocators. Uh, work was even done in the late evening. This was a team in Savage for recapture. Yeah, and this is in Lithuania. Uh, uh, that's me with uh, Vitautas Aigirdas. And Vitautas Aigirdas from Ventes Ragas uh, uh, ring station is a true, true hero. He started work alone before we arrived there. And he succeeded in uh, recovering and capturing 11 geolocator birds in Alcapolda. That was great. And one year later in 2020, he found the 12th bird and captured it. So it was really great, our local hero. So, and this was the result. We, from the 29 geolocator birds in Cervetsch, we got seven, 24%. In Alcapolda, we got back 12 out of 24 geolocator. That's sensational. Good result, excellent result. But surprisingly in Chirai, we didn't find any geolocator bird, despite there were plenty of aquatic warblers. We cannot explain that. We uh, fitted only seven birds with geolocators in 2018, where we got, we got none of them back. But altogether, 39% recovery rate in Lithuania was still excellent. 
and in total 32% of recoveries. And uh, what was also excellent was that all geolocators worked perfectly. So they all stored data for nearly the whole season. You can see on the graph uh, below that the um, geolocator which stopped earliest uh, data logging stopped at 8th of April and one measured until the 30th of May even and the median date was the 12th of May. So they measured up to 300 days. And all data were excellent, were valid, and could be analyzed by Simeon Lisowski. Yeah, and what you now see is the result, what the birds did. So as you can see, they went all to Mali and stayed there one month, two months, three months, four months. They did not move, only one bird moved a little bit uh, in the Niger Delta and in late February they went back. And the long stop over in Northwest Africa, Morocco, Algeria, and then back to the breeding sites. And we will have a look on the second run and some more comments. So the first longer stopover was in France, mostly uh, six days, then mainly on the Iberian Peninsula, two weeks. Then some stopover in West Sahara and Senegal, and then to the wintering grounds. Um, you can see the outliers in the West in Senegal data, in the East in Nigeria, Northern Nigeria. And you can see that there was basically no difference in birds from Lithuania and from Savage. And you can see in spring, the long stop over in Morocco, Algeria and Cota Doniana, and then a quick flight back to the breeding sites. Okay, that was a little bit quick, I guess. And so we will have a look at it in more detail. And these geolocator data uh, provided us really with a new view on the Annual cycle, of, uh, annual cycle of aquatic warblers. As you can see, uh, they spent, the male aquatic warblers spent on average 81 days in the breeding, at the breeding sites, 4th May to 23rd of July. And uh, on average on 24th of July, they started migration and uh, the auto migration lasted approximately 50 days. And the first stopover of more than three days uh, or more than at, at, or of at least three days were in France uh, for in the Loire estuary or southwards, uh, but only on average five days. And then they had a longer stopover in Spain and Portugal on average 16 days. Then they crossed Sahara and uh, some birds had a stopover in uh, Southern Morocco, uh, West Sahara, Mauritania, and then arrived the wintering sites on average on 12th September. And then you can see they spent more than half a year um, in the, at the wintering sites, up to 223 days they are at the, in the wintering sites, 223 days. Incredible, it was in, in Mali, one bird. And then uh, spring migration starts on average on 15th of March, uh, again, approximately 50 days. But uh, interestingly, there were many long stopovers in Morocco and Northern Algeria and Cota Doniana in Spain. Uh, in Cota Doniana, up to 53 days. One was, I think, 45, and one was 53 days in Cota Doniana. Uh, we believe that that might be birds which were forced to leave the winter grounds because the uh, winter grounds were drying up in, at the end of the dry season or towards the end of the dry season. And uh, that they were forced to, to start and 
and then to fuel up uh, again in, in Northwest Africa. Some birds had uh, stopovers in Southeast France, Mediterranean coast in Italy, and also Central Europe. And then they arrived on average on 4th of May. The earliest birds arrived at uh, breeding sites at, I think, 22nd of, of April. So that's an annual cycle. So um, you can say um, aquatic warbler, at least male aquatic warblers, are true uh, Malinese birds. And they are typical sex tourists because they go to Central Europe quickly, then mate with as many females as possible for two and a half months, and then back home to Mali. Of course, uh, this pattern might be different in female aquatic warblers because uh, approximately half of the females uh, do a second brood and they might be at the breeding site still in mid August or even end of August. And what we not know is whether the females uh, are migrating quicker so that the auto migration periods is shorter uh, or if they arrive later at the wintering grounds, or both, maybe. Uh, this is still an open question. Um, then we would have to put geolocators to females. Uh, um, but the risk is to, that you will not recover the birds in the next year, or only a small proportion. Yes, uh, so we, we produced a big table where you can see all the uh, countries where the birds had stopovers of more than 2.5 days. We excluded the very short stopovers, for instance, in the Sahara somewhere or uh, yeah, in, in uh, summer near the breeding grounds. And you can see that the first more important country is France in autumn, but only half of the birds had a stopover in France uh, at six sites in a Loire Estuary or south of it. And they stayed only six to seven days there on average between 22nd of July and uh, 31st of August. Most birds uh, between 6th and 12th of August. And in Spain, they stayed clearly longer, two weeks on average. Um, and bet uh, between end of July and mid-September, most of them in uh, mid-end of August. And they are refueling, obviously, in Spain. And some birds also in Portugal, but not that long, mostly only eight, eight, nine days. And only, yeah, I think, Nearly all birds had a, a longer stopover in Spain or Portugal, and some in Morocco and Mauritania and few in Senegal. And then you can see the wintering sites, uh, mainly Mali and adjacent areas in Mauritania and Burkina Faso, and then the two outliers in Senegal and Nigeria. Uh, on spring migration, it's different, of course. Uh, I already mentioned that we had this long stopovers in Morocco after Sahara crossing and in northern Algeria and in Cota Doniana. And then after that, only relatively short stopovers under the breeding sites. And I can see the time. Uh, what I want uh, to say is we had a French mission to uh, to Morocco to search for aquatic warblers in October. And they didn't find any aquatic warblers in October in Morocco. And this fits with our data because they leave Morocco already latest on 22nd of September. They, they, they have passed it when the French ringers have been there. And you can also see on spring migration uh, that the birds arrive in uh, south east France only in April, so rather late. So that's a picture of the stopover sites, and you can see. Martin, had, uh, yeah. 
yeah. you know, should be approaching to the end of the first presentation. You are now yeah. stepping in the second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. everything fine. Okay. Um, so you can see uh, the northernmost stop over site in France was in the uh, Loire Estuary. And you can see, um, uh, yeah, the stop over sites there. There are several stop over sites in northern Spain, which we cannot uh, uh, identify then in, at, along the Portuguese coast uh, down to Gibraltar. And um, then south of the Sahara, you can see in West Sahara in Mauritania near the coast. Um, and here's the distribution of the wintering sites. Um, and there you can see this concentration in the inner Niger Delta and surrounding wetlands of Niger River, Bani River. Then this is Sahel River. This is Baule River, Bukul de Baule National Park, uh, River Suru in Northwestern Burkina Faso. And uh, the blue dots that are the approximate locations of the former geolocator study, which were rather imprecise, but it's the same region. And the gray dots are uh, wintering records, um, most wintering records, which we know. Uh, it fits quite good together also in the southeastern corner of Mauritania. And uh, these are the major stopover sites in spring. Uh, and they are more inland as already assumed. Um, yeah. And uh, what we did now was to try to assign the localizations from the geolocators to specific sites, uh, known stopover sites or potential habitats. Oh, sorry. Uh, Another chapter short in between. Uh, Frederic Giguet from Paris Museum took our data to analyze the question of Sahara crossing. And this was even interesting. You can see this is a light pattern, uh, the daily light pattern of geolocator of one bird. You can see this a change in light that is caused by shading of the vegetation. So this bird moves in the vegetation over the day, then in the night it is dark, then again. And then you can see that there was one day with full light. We call it full light pattern. That means that at this day, the bird did a nonstop flight over the whole day, and then probably the whole night and then stopped. And uh, the second example is full day migration, then flight into the next day and then I went down at late morning or noon. And we found that in autumn, approximately the half of the birds had such days where they had a, full, a flight during the full day over the Sahara. And in spring, all birds, all unlike birds had this full light pattern. Can you see more examples from aut autumn migration? So that we had a clear picture about the Sahara crossing very quick and without, sometimes without short stopovers, uh, uh, very different to wheat warbler, for instance. Okay. So, and then we try to, to assign the birds to specific sites. And this is not easy, but we produced a big table for the two migration periods and the wintering sites. And uh, you can see the light logger coordinates with confidence interval, the durance of stay, in this case, 202 days, arrival, departure, and then the probable or possible site, it's more an informed guess, and the probability of correct uh, identification of the site. And then the coordinates of the possible site on the ground and the distance from geolocator localization and the short description. It was not possible to assign all wintering sites, for instance, to specific sites, but most of them at the end. And this is very interesting. And I will I show you two uh, examples. So it's you may have a localization of a stopover site somewhere in the Atlantic Sea, like here. 
And then you can look around and you can see, oh, there's a big lagoon in the east of this site. It's Naya Zerra in Morocco. It's a known site for aquatic warbler with several ringing records. This is a distance of approximately 10 kilometers. And so we can assign this uh, localization to Naya Zerga with high probability. Uh, other case is this case. Birds somewhere in the desert for nearly 200 days. Uh, what's, what's going on there? And then you can search in the surrounding uh, more and more. And uh, we took a radius of 80 kilometers. And then you might, might find such a site like here. It's, it's an inner delta of a small river, Isil, in southeastern Mauritania. Uh, in I think a distance of 80 kilometers to the geolocator localization. It is the best habitat for all feeling in the surrounding. And so we assigned this bird to in a easy data with low probability because the distance was rather big to the geolocator localization. And uh, how look such sites on the ground? We know it from, from uh, Aquila group. This is one site in Southwest Mauritania where they captured one bird in January, 2011. Uh, it's this uh, uh, bulrush vegetation in a swampy, uh, shallow uh, depression in the desert. And this is Gimi, there the French colleagues captured three birds in January, 2011. Looks quite similar. And now they returned there one year later, and one year later it looked like that, the same site. Uh, completely unsuitable for wintering aquatic warblers. Uh, so that means if you want to uh, interpret uh, satellite images and assign geolocator localizations to wintering sites, you need pictures, you need uh, images from exactly the time when the, the aquatic warblers were there. Uh, so exactly the year and the month because it changes according to local precipitation. And uh, uh, Gimi is looking at uh, the uh, Google picture like this, a little bit similar to Isil in a Delta. And uh, so we tried to use this uh, knowledge and experience of, of our research in West Africa and the French research to assign these birds to sites. This is huge, of course, you know this area, 170 square kilometers of regularly flooded area. And you can see this dark color, this is the dammed part of the Senegal River, it's a freshwater reservoir with cattail stands, not suitable for aquatic warbler. And then this more light color where the aquatic warblers were found in 2007. And you can see here our uh, mist netting sites of 2007. The white figures refer to places where we captured aquatic warblers and the green figures where we did not find aquatic warblers in 2007. Of course, most of you know this picture. This is at uh, Grand Lac in huge wintering site and this is also Grand, Grand Lac. And this is the uh, best area in the Senegal Delta. This is south of Tiget. Uh, it was this mist netting in 2007. And this is mainly white rice, Oritza longistaminata, where the, the aquatic warblers have been. And we know a lot about these birds in huge due to the studies of Cosima Tegetmeyer. She did her uh, doctor thesis there and uh, tracked the birds with the radio transmitters, followed them and measured the home ranges and found that they uh, have home ranges of two to three hectares and that they prefer edges within the, the sites, uh, small ponds and vegetation edges, uh, edges along water and so on. This is all described in her doctor thesis. Uh, we have less information about the inner Niger data. 
uh, of course, we know how this area looks like. We can refer to Swartz et al. living on the edge, where it's described very well. Uh, this is a group in 2011 uh, who visited in a, the inner NITA data and found aquatic warblers there. Uh, but you can see how different uh, the situation is there. Uh, in, in subsequent winters, in February 2011, nearly the whole area is green. And one year later, already in November, uh, most of the area was dry. So changing conditions. And even more extreme in uh, 1984, 1985, there were only 6,000 square kilometers flooded area in the Inner Niger Delta. And in 1999, 2000, uh, 26,000 square kilometers of flooded area. So the, the aquatic warblers have to cope with this changing conditions. Uh, and every year is different. And for me, it's very amazing that all our geolocator birds, they, uh, stayed at the same site for 200 days and did not change uh, the wintering site, but one bird in the Inner Niger Delta. It's uh, hard to explain. This is Inner Niger Delta. The, the green dots and the figures that are the places where the French colleagues captured aquatic warblers. It's the number of aquatic warblers they captured in February 2011. And the red dots are Local, uh, look, locations where they did not catch aquatic warblers. These are some pictures from there. Uh, this is Bourgou and reed grasses. And this was a place with the highest density of wintering aquatic warblers, a, a rather small depression surrounded by dry vegetation, not far away from uh, an arm of the uh, Niger River. Um, the inner Niger data is under pressure, not only by agricultural use uh, through grazing and overgrazing, but only but also through damming of tributaries. So uh, there are already three dams in Makala, in Dalo, and in Silingi uh, for electricity and freshwater reservoirs, and two more are planned. Uh, so the, the area is really under threat because this changes the whole uh, water um, regime of the Inner Niger Delta. And we have, I think we have to care about, it's uh, yeah, it, a little bit strange, but as far as we have such unsafe situation in Mali, civil war and so on, there will not happen a lot, uh, but Hopefully this time will go over and then uh, we will have probably problems. Okay, conclusions. Two minutes, Martin. Yes, the last slide, huh? Yo. Uh, so uh, obviously more than 70%, probably even more than 90% of the global aquatic border population winters in Mali and some adjacent site. Um, Question is where come the bird from in Senegal in Juj? And we can assume that they mainly uh, would come from Poland, Biebsha and maybe also Pomerania. So the Inner Niger data is of outstanding importance as wintering area on auto migration, France, Spain and Portugal of a are of great importance at stop oversights and fueling up uh, takes place mainly on the Iberian Peninsula. On spring migration, most important stop oversights in, are in Morocco, North Algeria, and South Spain. The stopovers up to 53 days. Um, adult males stay more than half of a year in the winter quarter. 100 days on migration and only 80 days on the breeding grounds. Females maybe 90 or 100 days. So and they stay there in the winter grounds for mainly five to seven months only. Uh, only one may have changed. Oh, so. 
So, and we think that the identification and conservation of the wintering sites in the Sahel and at the stopover sites in Southwest Europe and Northwest Africa is of crucial importance for aquatic warbler conservation and uh, that we have to, uh, must have a look on these sites mainly in Mali in future when it's possible to go there, for instance. Yeah, and of course, big thanks to all the people who supported this project. Uh, yeah, you can see them on this slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Uh, that's the interesting presentations, probably if you say it like that, uh, combined into one and uh, floor for questions. Uh, please uh, raise your hands and speak up. Okay, Lars, Lars Lachman, please. Ben Johanna. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation, Martin, and for this really superb project. Um, I think it's very impressive what you found out, um, all the things we've been looking for for, for many, many years in, in much more detail now. Thank okay. you very much. Um, I'm, I'm just uh, thinking... <laughs> Martin is not listening to me. <laughs> Um, that that anyway. was close, was close, nigga. Okay. <laughs> he also needs to listen to my question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we should uh, make uh, good notes from, from your results for the next um, MOU meeting uh, on the aquatic warbler under the CMS, because uh, you have identified quite a few important range states that we don't have uh, mm -hmm. in the MOU so far. I'm thinking about Algeria. Uh, I think Mauritania isn't included either. Um, Burkina Faso. Uh, Burkina Faso isn't. Uh, Nigeria isn't. Uh, I think Italy isn't. Um, so mm. uh, especially I Algeria, those kind of countries. I think they're very important. And especially, as you said, uh, conserving the uh, important stop oversights is of utmost importance. I think we need to get the countries uh, to even know that those sites are important. That's a, a very important step. Um, yeah, sorry, it wasn't a question really. It was just uh, making a it's note a for what we need to think about uh, for the next MOU meeting. I saw Yarek has noted something. So probably that's... Uh, <laughs> that's very good. Thank you. Okay, Joanna. Thank you, Lars. Martin, thank you for your your and Co Cosima's uh, presentation. Uh, thank you for mentioning uh, Acrola, Acrola team uh, from France. And uh, I have a question. What about, uh, do you have some plans about next uh, geoloca geolocator uh, project? Uh, what about Poland uh, geolocator project? Do you have some, some ideas, some plans? Uh, yes, we, uh, we discussed it already yesterday with Jarek. I think we will uh, talk about tomorrow on our aquatic water conservation team meeting. Yeah, it would be the best place. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, others, please raise hands. And while raising hands is appearing, uh, I would, uh, uh, concerning the next uh, steps, uh, I would just also drop uh, the idea maybe for tomorrow. What about the... Um, they're putting the geolocators on the translocated birds uh, to find out. Uh, yeah. And uh, then the, my question is uh, concerning this particular bird in Alka Polder, which was recovered by Vitalt as a year later. Did you manage to recover the data? And, uh, yes. Yes, it is included. It is included. It was the bird which wintered in Southeast Mauritania in Isil River. That was the 19th bird. Okay, the, okay, interesting. And it returned to Alcapolda also in 2019, not only in 2020. So uh, it was... Uh, uh, so you us missed omitted. that bird. Yeah, <laughs> without us omitted it. Unbelievable, because he found so many birds, but, <laughs> but he omitted that bird. Okay, very interesting. 
Uh, okay. Um, uh, any more questions? I don't see any raised hands. Ментас, можно задать вопрос? Давай, Александр, задавай, я привожу. Сколько мы исследовали динамику численности на наших территориях? Я всегда мог объяснить, почему в этот год больше, в этот меньше. То бишь, все можно было объяснить состоянием местообитаний на месте гнездования. И это значило, что на местах зимовки вроде все у нее окей. То есть там нет каких-то больших смертностей там в один год, в другой год. Как Мартин думает? Места зимовки еще стабильны, и за них нельзя, не надо опасаться? Uh, the question from Alexander is uh, uh, the context is that uh, that he has difficulties of explaining why in some years the numbers of aquatic warblers are higher, in some years are lower, and um, and uh, the interpretations was give, uh, given on the different years based on the understanding that. Uh, Situation in the wintering grounds is probably stable, stable and 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 good. Uh, the question of Alexandra to to you, Martin, is uh, what is your assumption? How what is the dynamics in the, in the wintering grounds? Is it uh, is it stable or 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 is it fluctuating the the conditions? I think at the moment. Um, it's fluctuating, of course. There are changes according to precipitation, it's clear. But in the last 20 years, as far as I know, there's no trend. That means you have, you have, you have, you have uh, wet years and huge flooded areas and bad years, but no overall trend in the wintering sites. So I think the trends which are measured in the breeding sites are induced by conditions in the, at the breeding sites. А это огромное болото, пойменное болото, оно имеет какой-то охранный статус? And this uh, huge uh, marshland, the, the, the delta, mm -hmm. does it have a certain uh, conservation status? Um, parts of it, parts of it, but I don't know what it means in effect. Um, they have some, some national parks um, in... Uh, in a Niger Delta, only small part than in uh, Sahel River floodplain and in Bukit Baule National Park, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, but I cannot assess the effect on the habitats, whether this has effects or not. I know not, not enough about. Okay, okay. okay. Lars? Yeah, I want to uh, remind you of the slide that Martin showed of the inner Niger Delta. I think Martin, when I understood it correctly, it showed that in the last years it had more water than in previous years. Um, yes, in some years, yeah. 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 Um, and you also said um, that the most flooded parts are not suitable for the aquatic warbler. So the aquatic warbler always needs the shallow flooded bits. Yes. And we can probably assume that even in drier years, the shallow parts are probably not that much reduced in size as the, the deeply flooded areas. So mm -hmm. I, I would assume that while there's no major changes happening there, we would get good aquatic warbler condition, wintering conditions also in years with a bit less uh, rain. But the thing that we need to worry about is if something completely changes in the hydrology, like with the dams that Martin has shown. I think that that's really the worry, not so much like uh, year-to-year -year changes, which the birds apparently seem to adjust quite well to, that some some sites they go to in, in wet years and other years they don't go there and they move on to the next wet site. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions? Uh, I have uh, two comments. One is the, the minimum area, flood area in the Inner Niger data in the last 50 years was 5,000 square kilometers. It was a minimum size. A minimum. The minimum size. Yeah. So it's likely that the aquatic rovers find some suitable areas there also in dry years. It was the first comment. And the second was about geolocator research in future, which we we'll discuss tomorrow. Um, um, I think we should explore areas um, 
where we are uh, rather sure that uh, the birds um, take not the same uh, migration route than the birds from Dikoya or Supi or Savage or so. Um, yeah, that's what I want to say. So we need we maybe, which is not so big, but in somewhere in Poland, in Northern Poland. It was the conclusion of our discussion yesterday. Okay, thank you. I'm just reading the, 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 the note from Benedict in the chat, uh, but I do not understand uh, if it is a question, but uh, probably not. Any questions? It was uh, just, uh, just a comment that for the Setch Wobbler, it seems that there is uh, a relation between rainfall and, uh, and the survival. So um, yeah, for, just, just a note. Yeah, it, in such warbler, it's a clear relation that it was studied, yes. Okay. Okay, so let's maybe uh, move on. Uh, we, we saved some five minutes. Um, and uh, let's go to the conservation of aquatic warbler stop over uh, sites in France. Christine Blaise. Yeah, Christine, I'm, I hope I pronounced your surname correctly. <laughs> yes, it's correct. Thank you. Um, I share my screen. Um, is it okay for you? Super. Okay, slideshow. Good. Yes, yes. perfect. Okay. Um, so, good afternoon. <laughs> And uh, I thank the organizer uh, to, for inviting me to make a talk today. Um, I work at the NGO Bretagne Vivante in Brittany. And for several years, I have been in charge for the coordination of the Species Action Plan for Aquatic Warbler in France. So the, the, the aim of uh, this presentation is the stopover in France. Uh, specific, specifically during autumn migration. We will present an assessment of the knowledge uh, and a few words about threat to the sites. On, on some of these sites, autumn migration is studied by ringing station. In a general way for the wheat bed or marshland passerine for many years, and in particular for the aquatic warbler, more specifically since the, the years 2000. And we will uh, see the data set accurate concerning the autumn migration of the aquatic warbler and how they can contribute to the um, knowledge of the success of the reproduction. <clears throat> so this is the map of all the place in France where an aquatic warbler has been seen since 1961. In green diamonds, uh, it's for the autumn stopover and in orange for the spring ones and cycle is for the history sites. Um, today, the knowledge of stopover in autumn migration is good, perhaps few missing in more continental areas, but it is very good on the Channel Atlantic coast. Um, the, the evolution of the knowledge, uh, before 1980, only a few sites were known and partly by sighting, not by ringing. Between 1980 and 1999, the ringing method was developing and knowledge too, especially in autumn migration. On this figure, you, can, you could see the progression of the knowledge on the autumn migration stopover with the number of new seats per year. You, you see that continue each year. Um, but what means this long list of sites in France? What is the functionality? Are there fattening area or only laying? All the part of the wetlands don't have equal interest for the aquatic warbler. And uh, we will see this point further in the presentation, but sometimes ringing stations are very close and in the same wetland, wetlands. Um, I give a um, few words about protection and management on stopover. Uh, important, important sites are in national natural reserve like Seine Estuary or Aiguillon Bay. Uh, for the 
Ogeon Bay, it's in Brittany. We have a new regulary measure for the aquatic warbler and other birds. But we have important area only in new open bird directive like Loire Estuary or Gironde Estuary. And, this, and it is not sufficient for the conservation of aquatic warbler habitats. Uh, the treat for the habitats is the absent or not sufficient of taking account of aquatic warbler needs, like uh, mowing date, water level. Often it is not optimum when aquatic warbler migrates. Um, for example, in agriculture, late date for mowing are mid-July, but it's, not, it's too Ill, earlier for the aquatic warbler. Uh, with the water level, we either have a lake or a very dry seat, and it's difficult to be heard by all managers. Um, Threats are different between sites, and they are a big work on local scale. But uh, uh, at the moment, we don't know if we have a global loss of habitats or a glo at, um, sorry, if we have a global loss of habitat at a global scale. Uh, we think yes, we think yes, but we don't have a precise picture. It is a main point for the second species action plan. We also have a loss of habitat due to global, global climate change. For example, in Gironde Estuary, they observe a loss of 50, uh, 50 hectare intertidal wetlands loss in, loss in six years. So about the ringing data and ringing station, um, this network of migration monitoring provides an important data set, like you can see on the graph. Um, a, a lot of capture, but also control along the migration in relation to breeding or wintering sites, interannual recatching, residence time and fattening data for the functionality of the stopover, and also information on the age ratio, as we will see in the last part of the presentation. But this network is very heterogeneous. As you can see, uh, we, no, we don't have the same number of stations each year, and then not the same lengths of nets. Um, here, not the same date and the same duration for each station. The method could change uh, between years, and um, ma a majority of stations monitor the migration for aquatic warbler only one year or for two years, but a very few one over 10 years. Um, th this network is very heterogeneous because not based on professional station, but on a network of volunteers, principally. Uh, it is a strange because we have many sites, diversity of data and diversity of habitats and new finding, but it's a weakness be, um, for the stability of the data set, uh, which requires testing several things to be able to analyze the data. Um, with this figure, you can see that a lot of station with few data. But um, what is the definition of a, a ringing station on the data set of the museum? Uh, for example, with the, natural, the National Natural Reserve or Seine Estuary, the green line is the limit of the reserve. And the, the layer, yellow point is the ringing station, and you see it's in the same uh, wetlands. So for the age ratio analysis, we plot uh, um, all stations in, uh, in the same wetlands to have um, um, less uh, sites and uh, to, to, to have more uh, information and more data. So um, the uh, site selection for the model, uh, we, we keep um, data since 1998, uh, monitoring at least two years, and total capture of aquatic warbler higher than uh, 15 for um, a wetlands place. Uh, so we could use uh, 36 sites and uh, 10,805 capture. The variable test uh, was year, time, 
and day of the year. Uh, the protocol is a, a specific protocol for aquatic warbler or um, an, another protocol like uh, for uh, all um, marshland pastry. And the sampling effort. Uh, for the moment, for this last variable, uh, we use the number of other marshland passing capture at the same place, not the length of uh, nets. Uh, the first result uh, is uh, that uh, they are an effect of the, of the day of the year. Uh, more adults are captured in the earlier early in the season, it's not, uh, it's already know, it's not new. Um, the time of capture have a little effect. Uh, more adults are captured at the end of the morning. Uh, this is the presentation of the model used by Christian Kerberiou uh, for people uh, who know um, mathematic uh, model. And uh, the result is uh, that, uh, uh, yes, yes, we have an effect of the year. It's what we are looking for, an effect of uh, the, the time and an effect of the date of the year and no effect of the protocol and the sampling effort. And it was what we expected. So uh, between year, we could observe interannual variation in age ratio of aquatic warbler capture during autumn migra migration on French ranking station. Uh, with the first uh, analysis, it seemed that the monitoring network is not too biased, uh, neither with the effort capture that change a lot between year and nor the protocol. Um, the, with, with the date of the year is in relation with the phenology, and we, st we still have questions about the influence of the time of capture that we need to investigate further. Uh, now the next step is to see if we could find codes playing on productivity. Uh, it is uh, the aim uh, for us uh, to be here today uh, and to present uh, this first result. Um, to ask you which weather parameters you think we we have to take into account. Um, uh, we think about rain, but which months? Uh, I see some answer uh, today in the presentation, uh, but uh, perhaps you have more advice uh, about this question. Uh, so thank you for your attention. And if you have uh, advice or uh, a data set to propose to could continue uh, our analysis. Okay, thank you, Christine. Uh, any questions, comments, advices as asked? Yes, Jana. And then Martin. Uh, by the way, Zemantas, as I you uh, chairman now, uh, can you uh, show your face and uh, switch on the camera because you are always back, maybe too many bottles of beers already on the table and you're afraid this. If you don't, don't mind. worry, everything okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> thank you. Uh, bonjour, Christine. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, I have a, uh, a question. Uh, what about uh, plans uh, for the future and this uh, protocol uh, Acrola uh, for the next years? Uh, for, the, uh, for the protocol uh, by the museum, you say? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, OK. Uh, for the moment, there are no plan about, uh, about it because uh, we have not finished the analysis of the data. So um, they prefer to um, to leave uh, the situation in the same uh, manner to 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 keep uh, the same data. And when uh, when we finalize analyze um, when we finalize analysis, uh, then perhaps they propose to change. Um, there are the big discussion uh, between uh, wingers in France now, but uh, the discussion is not closed. Okay. So I, I have no answer yet. 
Okay, because I think it's uh, it's it will be quite important to continue uh, ringing in uh, during uh, during migration. Uh, yes, but the money will be for for this project. Yes, but the difficult is. Um... Um, museum asked to continue monitoring, but uh, um, uh, financial people is not the same. <laughs> so it's difficult because scientists uh, ask for uh, um, continue monitoring, but don't pay. And so um, financial people ask uh, why it is necessary to continue. <laughs> so they are difficult, <laughs> but I hope to. Zimantas, we have data for успеху гнездования, успеху размножения, то есть сколько молодых появлялось в разные годы в соотношении взрослых и молодых. И было бы чрезвычайно интересно вот эти данные сравнить с соотношением взрослых и молодых на миграции. И совпадают ли они с нашими данными? Как это вот интересно? I'm sorry, Martin. Uh, 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 yeah, so, but, uh, but uh, uh, just translating Alexander's suggestion, but... Uh... It would be extremely interesting to compare uh, the, your data on the relationship between adults and juveniles with the uh, data available in Belarus. Uh, so they do have uh, data on this relationship on the breeding ground uh, of, between juveniles and adults. And so that would be very interesting to compare if there is any correlation between that. With with which data in Belarus? I understand that in Belarus they do have data on uh, relationship with, uh, with juveniles and uh, and adult birds, mm. and this is what similarly you did uh, with uh, with uh, ringing data in France, and yes. uh, from year from year to year. So that would be a, the suggestion from Sasha is. Uh, would be interesting to compare this data and to see if there are any proportions or correlations. Вот, допустим, допустим, 2015 год. У нас вообще не гнездились вертлявые камышовки, вообще не гнездились, потому что все было сухо. И вот интересно, в 2015 году у них соотношение было такое же, как обычно, или же оно было... For instance, in 2015, uh, in Belarus, uh, due to super dry weather conditions, uh, there was no... Uh, aquatic warblers breeding and no absence of juveniles. Uh, and is that somehow corresponds to your data yeah. that there is a lower decre or decrease of juveniles in 2015 migration? Yes, of course, it's, uh, it's the next steps we want to do. And for the moment, uh, we don't have data or um, uh, Christian Kerberiou uh, are looking for uh, um, data set, um, free data set, but it's difficult for us in uh, migration uh, land to, 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 to think about the, the good, um, the good uh, uh, variables. So it's why we ask to you. <laughs> and uh, we, are, we are looking for a collaboration with a breeding uh, land, of course. Okay, so su suggestion it's would be own. that you, you get into contact with each other and you exchange data and uh... Yeah. I think the results would be very interesting for everyone to, to see. Okay. Okay, Martin? Yes, uh, that could be a topic also for tomorrow for our discussion in the working meeting. Yes, I, I hope. Yeah, okay. I only want to mention that um, the proportion of juveniles and the population size uh, must not be correlated. So you can have a low population of aquatic warblers at the breeding site, but with a high breeding success and vice versa. So um, only for interpretation of results, um, um, that the, the population changes and breeding success must not be linked directly. Mm. Okay, so uh, yeah. uh, for example, we, we could have a um, um, decrease of the effective of the, of the adults, but some place with a very good uh, productivity. Yeah. Yes, for instance, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we think that in France and in, in Western part of the Europe, we have a, um, 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 not, uh, 
quasi oh, I don't know uh, the, the the whole population um, migrate so uh, we we can we 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 couldn't uh, say uh, from which part of the breeding population it's uh, the whole so but we we hope that uh, this uh, work about uh, age ratio uh, could be uh, in, correla in correlation with the uh, a global um, success of breeding and and um, a help for the monitoring of the global population it's not only uh, um, one population, it's uh, the global one. But perhaps it could help for the monitoring of the uh, whole population. Okay. Uh, Martin, you you wanted to uh, have a separate particular question? Okay, that was just the comment. No, thank you. It was everything, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there are any more questions. comments. Well, thank you, Christine, uh, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, let's go to Spain. Eugenio de las Heras, yeah, if I'm pronouncing the, the name correctly, the last presentation on the life projects of aquatic warbler conservation in Spain. Yeah, that's right. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll share the screen. Okay, that's right. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. I'm Eugenio de las Heras Martin, a technician of the LIFE uh, project uh, LIFE Paludicola here in Spain. Um, I, pres I have uh, prepared this presentation with my colleague, David Miguelet, who is the current coordinator of the LIFE project. Um, this one is developed by Fundación Global Nature, and two other life projects have been developed as well in the in the previous years. Um, the conservation of the aquatic warbler in Sepa Lanaba campus developed in La Nava Lagoon between 2002 and 2006. It, this one was a, a specific conservation project about the aquatic warbler, and then the Life Waterway of Castilla was developed between 2006 and 2010 in 34 different wetlands of this environmental corridor. Uh, this life project will, uh, worked with the um, aquatic warbler, but not only with this one, as uh, it worked also with uh, another interesting Mars birds. So this, uh, this information has um, made that we could uh, carry out the new life paludicola project since 2017 with experience acquired in the other lives. Um, this one is about the habitat restoration for the spring and autumn migration of the aquatic warbler in the Iberian Peninsula. This poses um, an extrapolation of the studies uh, carried out in La Lagoon and the other wetlands of the region to another parts of, uh, of the country of Spain and associated with the regional government of Castilla Leon. We took advantage of this and, and developed this project in La Nava Lagoon, who maybe you already know, and other two wetlands in the same region here in Palencia, then two inland wetlands in Castilla La Mancha, as you can see in, the, in this graphic, it's in the inland part of Spain, and then also in four uh, coastal marshes in the Mediterranean coast in Comunidad Valenciana. Recently, the by the COVID-19 crisis, um, the project was extended one year more until 2021. So in this year, we will uh, finish the pending actions of the project. And now we will see the, the most important ones about conservation itself, species population monitoring and coordination, but there are another important communication, environmental education, networking, or indicators calculation actions. So um, talking about the conservation ones first, um, carried out by the project, in order to preserve and improve the suitable area for the aquatic warbler uh, in Spain, in the migration stops and stopovers sites uh, in the Iberian 
Spanish country. The first one was purchasing surrounding lagoons. So here you can see the Boada Lagoon, one of the three lagoons we manage here in, in Castilla Leon. Um, as you can see, the blue plot is the one managed by the local municipality. Then the green plots are um, uh, farm plots are really bought by Fundación Global Nature. And then the important action of the project is based on the orange ones. The orange plots are uh, farm plots who, which uh, the project, the life project has bought in order to continue flooding the lagoon and expanding its range. In total, 17.7 uh, hectares were purchased by this way. Then some actions related with the vegetation management developed in the project are the grazing, the mowing, or the deep soil uh, removal, the topsoil removal. About the livestock grazing, as you can see here, uh, we took this measure uh, establishing agreements with local rangers of the area to promote traditional cattle raising, mainly with uh, cows and sheep. And this practice, for instance, in Comunidad Valenciana was lost and resumed again thanks to the project. And in total, we have uh, grazed in this way uh, more than 400 hectares in total in the between the nine uh, lagoons. Then the some actions related with the vegetation management. Another one uh, promoted through traditional mowing with a tractor in the inland wetlands of the countryside. And then um, with, um, with an amphibious machine in the coastal marshes of Comunidad Valenciana, as you can see here. Um, with this one, well, this allows mowing in deeper wetlands, like the ones we have in the Mediterranean coast. And it's, uh, it represents a new measure taken in the country, in Spain, that will continue in the post-lifetime. With both of them, with tractor and uh, amphibious machine, we have mowed uh, a total amount of uh, 85 hectares. And then the topsoil removal. Thanks to previous experience, uh, it, has, it has been shown that this measure is the best one to manage the, the vegetation in these wetlands in the long term. So this effective measure has been also continued in this life project. With this one, we have removed, removed a total amount of five hectares. Then the plantation of uh, herbaceous species and bush crops, including also 310 flora species, in order to improve the suitable area for the aquatic warbler, uh, diversification of the habitats, um, man managing, uh, taking advantage of this, uh, this favors the uh, feeding and refugee areas for this bird. Hydraulic works has also been developed here. Uh, in order to renovate and improve in infrastructures that provide water to the lagoons and the marshes and favors its flooding and water management, thus improving many different bird species, not only the aquatic warbler, but also another marsh birds, birds. With, uh, with different management, such as ditches cleaning or weirs, gates, and water intakes maintenance. Another conservation measure taken in the project uh, is the American mink control. This, is, uh, this represents an invasive species regulator and reduces the, the pressure, the predation pressure on the colonies of ghouls, waders, herons, and other birds here in Castilla Leon wetlands. And the last conservation measure we are taking in this, we are carrying, carrying out in this uh, life project is the obtaining vegetation cover and composition indicators. Thanks to this work, we could update the flora inventories uh, for the working wetlands and thus increasing knowledge about them and how to manage them correctly in the area. Now, talking about the aquatic warbler monitoring, this of course is a very important part of the LIFE project in which three scientific ringing campaigns have been developed. And another one, the fourth one, is intended to be developed in, in this year, in, 20, in 2021. Uh, it has been developed not only the census and monitoring of aquatic warbler, but also about another marsh birds, 
in the prenuptial passage in Comunidad Valenciana, where, as you can see, 40 aquatic warblers were captured between the three campaigns, and also in the inland wetlands of Castilla-La Mancha and Castilla-León, where a total amount of 111 aquatic warblers were captured by, by this way in this in these inland wetlands. So the total amount represents uh, more than the 50% of the whole aquatic warbler captures in Spain in this period between 2018 and 2020. Then, by now looking closer to the results obtained in this period, in La Nava Lagoon, the Acrola Index presented intermediate values uh, compared to those obtained in the, in the past, as you can see in the in this graphic with compared with the available studies. And what is more striking is the decrease found in the percentage of juveniles in the two previous uh, years compared to the historical record, as you can see here. An interesting uh, data is that uh, we know that in the other, the second most important place in Spain to capture uh, aquatic warbler, they present similar results as ours. Uh, in 2019, they had a juvenile percentage of uh, less than uh, less than 1500, and then in in 2020, they obtained a juvenile rate about uh, between 20 and 30 percent. So, these uh, astonishing results, I think, uh, they they should be highlighted and maybe commented as well. So then in the inland Castilla-La Mancha wetlands, as you can see, the lagoons are not so favorable for the species because they are drier, which is demonstrated by the low um, catch data and the Acrola index obtained here. And at last, in Comunidad Valenciana, in the coastal marshes of the Mediterranean Sea, is where the prenuptial migration efforts uh, were made. As you can see during this period, high Acrola index were obtained, but uh, with very different results among the different wetlands we are working on. Within the coordination actions, one of the most important ones of the project has been the, develop, the development uh, of a national strategy for the aquatic warbler conservation in Spain, what we are currently working on. We began uh, with a record database creation and a bibliographic compilation of the species in the whole country in Spain. Then surveys were made to managers and its conservation experts in each regional autonomy in the country. And um, we're, we're, we are finishing to prepare a request for the Environmental Ministry of Spain to include the species in the national catalog of threatened species in the category of uh, vulnerable as, as the one is cataloged in, in the rest of Europe, in the whole Europe, for, for that we will ask you soon to help us to support the document before presenting it, if you could do so. Uh, it would be very important for us and the species in the, in the country, for the conservation of the species in the, in the country. Also, scientific and technical basis for the conservation of the species in Spain, uh, including the situation of the species, in its autonomous community, so at a national and a regional level, uh, were also made, and all of these uh, will be supported uh, with a national conservation strategy draft document and the development of an agro-environmental program for the wet, wet for its wetlands vegetation management. For the request to change for the special uh, regime in the list of wild species to the inclusion of the species as vulnerable in the national catalog of threatened species, we based our document on the fact that uh, Spain is a, has a key role in the passage of the, of the aquatic warbler as we, as we have uh, seen in, in Martin's presentations, and also um, added to the decline in population size in the breeding countries and the reduction of the dis distribution area, all of us made in, makes a, uh, Spain a very important place in the migration, so that we consider that um, including this species in the national catalog as vulnerable uh, could help a lot to the species conservation because of its important its importance not only in the postnuptial passage but also in the prenuptial one as we as we have seen already. 
um, all this work of bibliographic search and consultations to banding offices allowed us to update the historical information of the species in Spain. So here we saw that more than 3,050 3, different individuals were captured or seen uh, in historical records among more than 210 different wetlands, not only in the postnuptial passage, as you can see, of course, is the most important in the country, but also in the prenuptial passage in the Mediterranean coast. Uh, and uh, this has made it possible to uh, obtain over the years uh, almost perfect information about the phenology in the country. So as you can see, it's mostly in the month of April, talking about the prenuptial migration and talking about the postnuptial one in the months of August and September. As you can see, uh, recording the historical data records of the species captures and visual uh, records in the story of the of the country, uh, you can we can see that the many efforts were uh, implemented in the year two thousand. That's the reason of the of this uh, amazing rising in the graphic. And then uh, since this year, uh, many efforts about uh, capturing this this bird has been already made. This has made it possible to publish scientific notes and articles separated between communist autonomous communities, so as a regional level, and knowledge updating about the species, especially expanding the knowledge and the understanding about its prenuptial route throughout the Spanish Mediterranean coast. Talking about that last topic, we saw that the first historical record of a uh, aquatic warbler in Spain, in this region, in the Spanish Mediterranean coast, uh, was in La Albufera in 1903. Since then, uh, 356 different individuals were registered in, three, in 36 different wetlands of the region. As you can see, the southern wetlands, uh, they have less, uh, a less uh, ratio of captures because they, they, their conditions are not so favorable for the species as the other ones in the center and the north of the, of the Mediterranean region. And in this, in this area, uh, they, it stands out the Delta del Ebro, El Marjal del Moro, or La Albufera wetland in Valencia. And now with better knowledge of the migration in this territory, it is clearly seen that the prenuptial one, the prenuptial passage is much more important in the, in the region than the, than the postnuptial passage. The 70% of the individuals uh, were registered during the prenuptial passage with a maximum ratio capture in, in the month of April, while in the postnuptial passage, uh, the 30% of the birds were captured with a maximum in September. Most of these birds were registered in the prenuptial passage in Spain with the number of 89% of them, which crosses by the Mediterranean coast to, um, to go again to their breeding sites in Central and North Europe. And with a historical percentage of juveniles rate in postnuptial passage around the 80 uh, percent. To summarize the most important aspects of the aquatic warbler migration through the Mediterranean coast during the autumn passage, the postnuptial one, this one is a more considerably scarce with the spring one in the Mediterranean region. Uh, with a specific campaign developed in August 2020 in the National Park Elondo in the marshes of, of Comunidad Valenciana with no capture of aquatic warbler. And um, recent, and uh, not even that recent studies as the one uh, which Martin has just uh, right now talk us about, the recent route discovered for the postnuptial passage through the north of the Mediterranean region may imply that these wetlands of this uh, Mediterranean coast can serve as an entrance to the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, this was thanks to the geolocators' uh, studies and researches, and thus the presence in the months of July and August in this Mediterranean Spanish region is likely to be underestimated, while the real role these wetlands play is unknown, at least for adults. 
the percentage of juveniles uh, obtained here in the postnuptial passage uh, is about uh, the 80%, which is similar to the one registered in other areas of the rest of the, of the peninsula. And for the spring passage, the numerous catches in the specific banding campaigns uh, carried out by the Life Paludicola reflect the high importance of the Iberian Mediterranean coastal wetlands in the postnuptial uh, passage. And, may, and these numbers may also have been under, uh, underestimated. In this case, uh, in the prenuptial passage, the aquatic warbler, uh, they preferably use these wetlands as stopping and resting areas during the day instead, and to a lesser extent to research, to research energy uh, reserves. The prenuptial campaign indicate intermediate weight and fat parameters compared to Iberia and lower than in France and a very low recapture rates. To finish my presentation, just highlight that, however, this data, unfortunately, the state of conservation of the Spanish Mediterranean, Mediterranean wetlands leave, leaves uh, much to be desired, and the great extension of these ones along the coast have been changed in the past century through industrialization and expansion of the tourist sector, turning into a more urban environment. And uh, at this point, uh, just commenting that uh, we are preparing the final Congress of the Life Paludicola between October the 5th and October the 7th of this year. And all of you, uh, of course, are invited to assist and participate. And then uh, just saying that thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, you fit it perfectly into 20 minutes so the most perfect fit into the time ah, thank you and uh, i hope all others uh, i hope all others can uh, mark the, the dates for your final congress uh, and uh, and hopefully participate have a possibility to participate it live and not in a distance mm -hmm. yaroslav has a question uh, yes, but maybe first uh, Eugenio can uh, stop uh, sharing so we can see each other. Yes, of course. Yes, please. Okay, October 5th, 7th, 2021. Oh, Just... That's so, right, yeah. Hola, Eugenio. Buenas tardes. It was Buenas tardes, thank you. Very good presentation. I have two comments and two questions. Uh, so, okay. uh, first of all, uh, referring this changing uh, the protection status in in uh, in Spain is a very important uh, issue. But mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, we can her, uh, help or we can work uh, together through the CMS MOU. Uh, work uh, because it's just uh, very important for this range country. So uh, we, we can follow and discuss this during the uh, meeting of Aquatic Global Conservation Team because in fact we should even plan the next MOU uh, because last was uh, six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, the agro-environmental schemes you want to develop for, for Spain. It is also uh, well fitted because uh, now there is this uh, new programming period. We have now two years uh, a buffer between uh, previous programming and the next programming because uh, then uh, the uh, new CAP will be introduced uh, together with uh, the new biodiversity strategy of EU, which is focused uh, uh, a lot on the Meyer uh, and generally on wetland conservation and restoration, so it works very well. Uh, we in Poland, we are working very, uh, very hard in this uh, in case uh, for aquatic world and generally for uh, uh, including all these uh, peatlands into this uh, scheme. So. Uh, we can discuss it uh, later. But the questions, uh, you have shown a, a, a very good example of your contracts with farmers uh, uh, about the grazing with the traditional cattle. Uh, uh, it is within the project. And uh, my question is because we have always problem in Poland with 
sustainability of such action because within project you you can pay for farmers and they uh, start to graze in traditional way but mm -hmm. what will happen after the project how you cope with this to make it sustainable this is one question and the second uh, question is you have shown the uh, American mink re removal, which is the general problem in whole Europe. And uh, we have also this problem, uh, but one of the problems which we have not solved very well is what to do with this American will, uh, mink after the removal. What are you doing with them after you capture them? So this is the question. Reeling. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, related with the first question, uh, these measures, we established them uh, um, establishing different agreements with local ranchers, local grazing livestock farmers and stuff. And uh, about the post lifetime, it's intended to, uh, to raise the many of the measures taken during these four years, they are intended to be extended uh, within five more years. So most of the agreements we are making right now, uh, they are going to be uh, five more years. For example, the, the agreements with the local rangers, also the uses of the amphibious machine, for example, in the coastal marshes of Comunidad Valenciana, it's intended to be continued during the post lifetime. So not only during these years, but also for the following five years as well. And talking about uh, the measure about the American mean control, uh, we are partners in this life with the regional government of Castilla y Leon, and they are the ones uh, developing this, this measure. So uh, specifically, uh, they capture the, the American mean. Uh, actually, we have captured uh, an amount of uh, 59 different individuals during these three campaigns, and then they they sleep over them, the individuals. Okay, thank you. Okay, Lars? Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I found very interesting your observation that you had a, a very low uh, juvenile ratio in the last two years. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me of the fact that in the last uh, conservation team meeting, we uh, were uh, thinking that we should establish a monitoring of this juvenile ratio as a, as a monitoring of the breeding success, as of course it, this could be because uh, lots of breeding sites had very low water could be a reason for a low breeding success. Unfortunately, I had missed the parts or the most parts of the presentation from France before. So I can't say whether there's a, a similar uh, observation in France with the low uh, juvenile ratio. And I was wondering whether we know anything about the process of uh, giving, putting the Spanish and the French data together to create something like a breeding success index as we suggested three years ago. If anybody knows more about it, maybe you could update us on that. Yes, of course. Uh, this is an interesting thing. And actually, we highlighted this this uh, this data of the presentation because it's uh, it's bad news, and we 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 need and we were uh, intending to put in this into the table, and maybe tomorrow in the in the meeting we can discuss it more. But the number of the, the low number of the of the uh, juveniles rate. So with the fact that the the, the other the other point of the Iberian Peninsula, which has the more captures of uh, aquatic warbler, so as they shows their information and it's similar to ours, uh, we could think that the problem is in in the table. So this is a real problem. It would be also very interesting to compare it with the French results, of course, and try to establish if it's a, a common pattern of these uh, two last years or something. Maybe it could be uh, owing to the bad uh, flooding or water management uh, years in the breeding countries. Maybe the productivity 
were, was lower or something, but uh, yeah, it's an interesting thing to put into the table the the very low ratio of uh, of juveniles. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe a short comment from France, from Christina. Did you observe the same pattern in the last years of a low, rather low ratio of the juvenile birds ring? Um, um, we we don't uh, we don't look at the whole uh, data for the last two years. Uh, in my presentation, I I show you the data uh, since. Uh, uh, since uh, since uh, 19, uh, yes, 19, um, because for the moment um, we focused on the uh, on the on the mathematical model and uh, on the effect of the of the heterogeneous data. Uh, if uh, the the change of the protocol or the change of the effort change um, each year, between you. And so uh, the first uh, question is to know if uh, there are an effect about uh, age ratio. So uh, we uh, only test uh, a part of uh, our data set. Um, but uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, this year, uh, uh, not this year. Last year is a very, very uh, bad, um, uh, bad, uh, bad year for the ringing station uh, for all uh, marshland passerin and for aquatic warbler too. And uh, we have a part of results uh, like uh, in Seine Estuary, or in fact there are a very, very low um, uh, proportion of juveniles, but. Um, uh, at first, uh, at first uh, um, rapid analyze, I see that uh, the situation uh, seems to be not the same on uh, Channel Coast and on Atlantic Coast. Uh, in San Estuary, uh, it seems that uh, it's not exactly the same situation like in uh, Loire Estuary. So we have to continue to, to, to look at that. Um, and uh, about the question to uh, to pull uh, data from different uh, land in West Europe, it's a question of the Aquatic Warbler Conservation Team uh, three years ago. And uh, uh, yes, I think it's a, it's a good idea. Uh, for the moment, uh, we are not uh, we are not ready because uh, we have problem to begin the analyze, and now it starts. So. Uh, uh, I think uh, with the, with the, this first presentation, it's um, it's uh, the first step, the first step to continue and uh, uh, to work with uh, breeding sites, uh, to work with uh, other um, uh, migration sites, and to propose some collaboration. It's, uh, mm -hmm. but we are yeah. at the beginning. <laughs> okay. Yarek, Martin, maybe we put this on the table for tomorrow, or do you have any comments right now? I understand that three years ago we had this idea and uh, it seems to be valid still. Okay, I see knocking heads, so which means that we will discuss it rather than tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, any more questions, comments? No raised hands. Yeah, okay, then uh, it looks that we finished the first day of the conference. Uh, uh, we saved some 12 minutes for, for your evening program. Unfortunately, uh, individual for, evening program. For one beer more, you mind us. Yeah, 12, 12 minutes is, I think it's a good time for, for a one beer. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, uh, I, tomorrow we meet uh, 9.45 is starting the program, the worship time, so Central Eastern uh, set time. Uh, so and then in the agenda, there is a link, which I believe that's the same link as today's link. I'm just looking. It's... No, it's not uh, the same. Uh, I was not very sure ah, if different. it can be stored. So better I uh, install another link. So please uh, use the next link for tomorrow. You have always uh, this link on your agenda. So just use uh, the, these links. 
uh, uh, for the symposium. Uh, all are also invited to aquatic world conservation team meeting. So uh, uh, we will provide tomorrow the link for those who still have not uh, uh, received the links. Uh, okay, is... so please for tomorrow uh, launch the agenda file and in the top of, there is a link. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, probably now is the saddest part of the program because usually when the, this part ends, uh, then we agree on the gathering somewhere together. So now we simply have to skip this part and uh, say goodbye and uh, then meet tomorrow. Yeah, uh, before we will uh, say goodbye, uh, I, I can tell uh, some of my remarks about today's meeting because uh, you know, we make the aquatic Wolber meeting for the first time in such a, a way, I mean, via online platform. And uh, I was afraid when we start this uh, because in fact uh, we use it, but uh, I've never organized such a large meeting with uh, 50 participants. Uh, and I know because once uh, with uh, Sława Wałasiuk, we make uh, official meeting uh, on a Microsoft Teams platform. And we have big problems with uh, sharing of the screens, with the discussions uh, on chat and so on. If you are not host, you are not allowed to do anything. So, uh, and today we have, in fact, no problem. It was very good with uh, sharing the presentation to, with uh, all technical issue. So I'm very satisfied from the technical point of view of this. And uh, what does it mean? Uh, my remarks that we should uh, make it uh, more often. I mean, uh, consider to meet uh, within Aquatic World Bear team more often because now it is more accessible than before. It's, it is even not necessary to do within any conservation project because it doesn't cost anything just to Zoom. Um, and uh, we should also consider to make some more specific uh, 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 meetings. For example, what I, am, uh, uh, I missed uh, for this uh, seminar, it's of course my fault in some way, we haven't not uh, take advantage from this that we can invite uh, people who normally not take part just from financial point of view. I mean, for, for example, from Africa, we should consider to make maybe specific meeting with our uh, African partners uh, because we are talking about Africa, but uh, among Europeans, in fact. So uh, just, just uh, uh, it's my uh, remarks uh, for, for this, just to consider for, for next uh, times. But at least within our Aquatic World Bank Conservation family, we should meet uh, more regular in this way. So uh, this is uh, uh, my thought uh, for today. And uh, tomorrow, as Jemantas uh, uh, told, we will uh, meet uh, a quarter to 10 to start uh, exactly at 10 o'clock with the uh, symposium. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you and uh, have a good evening. Yeah. Thank you, Jarek. Thank you. Relax Thank now. you. Bye-bye. <laughs>